Welcome to the Mentis Podcast. Today we have Luke Smith with Wellspire. Appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. So how'd you get started with managing money and and really kind of growing your, your book of business? So it's it's an, it's an ongoing story, so it's never finished, but I um, graduated with a degree in finance from Salisbury University, thought about going the law school route, um, and you know I heard from several attorneys and law professors, you either love law school or you love practicing. And I kind of thought, I'm probably the person who would love the you know, the theory and the education, but not actually enjoy the, the practice. So I decided to, you know, meld together my interest for people and finance. And financial planning was a no-brainer. Interviewed a few in college and just, you know, they raved about the industry. And so I went for it. Um, that was coming up on five years ago. So since then, just been, you know, getting CFP letters, which I think is you know, the gold standard in our industry, and if anything, should be a requirement to give financial advice, in my opinion, and industry's headed that way. So, been doing that, and as you said, building the book of business, so. Which is a great way to make sure you're not having a conflict of interest, essentially. It's, Definitely. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's important as well. So, having a interesting economy right now is probably impacting a lot of people, uh, certainly people in the stock market. Mm-hmm. What do you what are you seeing for the next year? What do you recommend people? What do you recommend people do? I mean, I mean, yeah. a lot of people are uh, <laughs> sometimes scared and they just want to pull it out, and it doesn't seem like a wise move. But yeah. what's your take on I'll that? I'll give you the very annoying financial planning answer, which is it depends. Okay. Um, but to put it in, I guess three general buckets. Um, it depends on where you are in life. So of those three, I would say if you're a asset accumulator. A young person mostly this is great I mean not only is it not bad it's great so the stock market's the only place in the world where when everything goes on sale people run out of the store right I mean if I told you you could buy a company for X amount or 80% of X amount which would you choose and like no-brainer give me the discount this is that opportunity so for anybody contributing to their 401k you know bi-weekly Anybody who's looking to, you know, get a nest egg together to start a business or buy a home that's, you know, five years out, it's an excellent opportunity to be putting cash to work in anything that makes money. So stocks, real estate, um, bonds even are attractive. You can get good yield on bonds now. Having said that, um, again, it depends on where you are. So the second bucket, um, let me jump past the second to the third would be people who are spending their money, or retirees. Retirees, again, it can be a good thing that interest rates have gone up. Bonds now that we're paying you know, 1%, now you can get 4.5% on the same bond with the same risk. That's good for net savers. Most retirees aren't taking out mortgages. So for a borrower standpoint, not really a problem. So again, it can be a positive. If the portfolio has been structured correctly, then they shouldn't be selling equities during this time. They should be living on their fixed income, let's say. And then the, the second bucket, which is really the, the hardest, I would say, is the capital preservers. So this is somebody like five years out from retirement. This just stinks mm-hmm. because there's a tendency, you know, we were talking before the podcast about um, property values. There's a tendency for folks to use their high watermark Right, so they see their portfolio and it's you know, X amount of dollars. That's how much money I have. So to see it fluctuate down 15%, that number is always in the back of your head. But if you ever hear people say, well, the losses aren't, they're not realized, right? They're, not, they're just paper losses. They were paper gains too. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a, it's a temptation to use your high water mark, if that makes sense. Paper gains, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Nobody likes to think that way. Yeah. So, if you have, I mean, obviously there's opportunity for every type of, um, you know, every type of economic climate that we have. And I, I like that you pointed out younger people have a really great opportunity right now to get into the market, and because you're not going to be looking at this for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. It sounds like overall, you're kind of a set it and forget it type of 
type of financial planner. You're not day trading on this stuff, um, but you are paying attention. Is that an accurate assessment? Um, it's it's a accurate generalization. Okay. Um, but I would say if you look at any empirical data or research, um, no matter what's in the portfolio, the most important uh, asset allocation decision is asset class. So broadly, large companies, small companies, international, real estate, gold, commodities, that decision is 90% of the return. Mm -hmm. What stock or what industry, all of that is minutia trying to eke out you know, some extra basis points. So I think it's probably similar in real estate is office space, um, warehouse. That decision is most important. The specifics of where to find the deal, a little bit more, I'd say, pinching basis points out. Um, but in any case, you know, I like to encourage people, just buy things that you know make money. So take real estate. You're getting rent every month. Stocks make money. People buy hamburgers, iPhones, two by fours. And again, talking McDonald's, Apple, Home Depot, right? These companies make money. Cryptocurrency could be the future, could be a great store of value, inflation hedge, all the things that's been claimed, but it certainly doesn't make any money. So that was actually one topic I wanted to, to bring up. Obviously, the, the headlines with Sam Bankman uh, in you know, FTX. What was your take? Did you have any clients affected by it? Did you see this coming? Um, you know, mm. What was the general office sentiment when you guys saw this massive write-down uh, you know, in, mm. in crypto? We definitely didn't have any clients affected. Okay. Um, vast majority of our clients are asset allocators, traditional asset classes, real estate, stocks, and bonds. Um, on the subject, look, you want decentralized currency. Here's decentralization. No regulation. It attracts fraudsters. And so for as decentralized as it is on the positives, there's sure. negatives to decentralization. So anytime an asset class goes up hundreds of percent per year, in flock opportunists, and if that asset class is not regulated, those opportunists a lot of times turn out to be fraudsters. The one comment that he made that really was just, I, I, at the time I didn't really know it, but it, it just didn't sit right, was he was asked if he would donate a billion dollars to the next presidential election. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, we would consider it or something along those lines. And you're a growing company, which means you should be reinvesting all of your capital. It was like... Either you thought he had just unlocked the most profitable engine ever created or that there was just something going on. And obviously it was the latter. But, you know, it, it's the it's sometimes like really obvious when you see these types, you know, types of things. It's it, it's too good to be true. Too good to be true. Yeah. And I think a lot of people got attracted to that based on the fallacy of celebrity. Mm -hmm. so Tom Brady's an investor in the company. Um, all these commercials at the Super Bowl of people that people love saying, go to FTX, go to this, go to that, buy this. And it was, you know, they were day trading a multi-billion dollar balance sheet. So incredible that it didn't pop sooner, but it only took a week. I mean, when the air let out. It was fast. Yeah, <laughs> it was really fast. Um, and then the CEO that took over. Uh, Enron mm -hmm. came in and he said this was the worst worse than Enron <laughs> yeah like that was that was stunning so uh, all right so how about Kathy Wood mm. not doing well this year um, but seems very bullish on her strategy still believes Tesla is going to be an $800 mm -hmm. stock um, certainly missed a buying opportunity about you know six weeks ago with Tesla where you could have uh, what 60% gains in the last month or something like that mm -hmm. uh, is Kathy losing credibility, or is she uh, still really seen as, um, you know, maybe this mover and shaker that she just kind of became during the pandemic? Forward thinker. Yeah. Kathy Wood's interesting, and she actually just had her, this January was her best month ever, um, along with, as you just said, Tesla. So it really ties into interest rates, um, which is interest rates go up companies, real estate, everything has to have a higher return to, to meet the, the cost of borrowing. 
particularly hurt by that is growth companies, which is what Kathy Wood, you know, was, is all about. So if you take a company like Uber that burns cash, you know, billions a year, the goal is they'll take over the taxi market and eventually become profitable. Well, if interest rates go up, you know, tenfold like they did, that pushes that timeline out really far and it makes every ride that loses money that much more expensive. So nobody wants those companies right now. Having said that, all that stuff right now, and this is, you know, first month of 2023, is, is skyrocketing. I mean, having a nice bounce. Why? Because people are starting to talk about a pivot. So Is that permanent or do you think that we're too early? Mm, I wish I knew the answer to that. I wish you knew the answer to that too. The Fed for sure is focused on stamping out inflation and they should. That is a, a, an appropriate goal. The problem is they might be too super focused on it. So we're seeing the inflation data is coming in as expected, trending downward. Goods have completely flatlined. Services are still a little high and some haven't, haven't peaked. But if you know, you're looking at past data, all that stuff's six months old. So when you look at rents, they look at six month old data. There is real time data, but the Fed doesn't focus on it as much because they don't want to make short term decisions, which is fair. But the real time data is, is showing, you know, everything is coming down rather quickly. So if they decide, you know, we're not going to have the 70s again at all cost, and the 70s was they raised rates, decided to start cutting as inflation came down, and inflation ramped right back up. So you extend that cycle three years instead of 18 months. They don't want that again. They've pretty much come out and said they will not allow that to happen. So I think, unfortunately, they're going to wait until it shows up in the six-month-old data and like usual, maybe be a little bit behind it. But every job looks easy when you're not the one doing it. They're smart folks at the Fed. Um, and, you know, so far so good on this soft landing. We'll see. Um, depends on how long they want to keep rates higher. But, I mean, financial conditions have eased a little bit. And he didn't come out yesterday and say, you know, there's more pain ahead like you said, in August of 22. So, you know, you have stocks up 10% this year already in some asset classes. That's, you know, the market is telling you, looking out 18 months, because that's what the market does, it's a discounting mechanism. It's seeing through this a little bit. And rates are preempting the Fed to cut. I mean, the two year has, has cratered, despite that rates are still going up. Which is bizarre. The bond market is basically saying, we don't believe you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it's totally inverted. Um, Chairman Powell looked a little more on edge yesterday. Um, he seemed a little more stressed. I don't know. And I know it could just be a bad night of sleep, but you know, it could be anything. Sure. But there, you know, there's so much uh, attention to even his body language, to <laughs> just how he says things or pronounces things. Um, uh, but he didn't seem like he was going to waver. Like, like it seems like this is going to, he's keeping the interest rates high for in, at least in his mind for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. It, I didn't seem to think he was, you know, kind of lying about that. I, you know, he's like, I think we're going to go up another couple 25 bips here and there and mm -hmm. we'll see. You know, it wasn't like, Hey, by the end of 2023, you know, we're going to cut this thing back down. No. Um, if there. anything, he mentioned, he's like, I'd rather go too far because we have tools to come back down and, and juice it a little bit. But, it seemed like he was really, I don't know, hyper-focused, like you said, on 2%. I think there's an argument to be made there, which, you know, he has said in the past, on, on that front, we can fix it if we go too far. I mean, look at what happened during COVID. They fixed it quick, fast. Yeah. So I do think their tools on the other side are much more, um, are much stronger and quicker. Well, people like taking that medicine. Yeah, bring Cash. it on. Yeah, <laughs> you're just giving money to the system. So I think there's a point to be made there. Uh, having said that, I think they're playing tough guy to some degree. I could see that. Um, they've, in the past decade, gone much more towards guiding than the actual action. So, for example, I think everyone and their brother knew tomorrow, you know, yesterday was going to be 25 basis points. 
it used to be they wouldn't tell you. Oh, yeah. It used to be a guessing game of what they were going to come out and say. And his philosophy and the Fed's philosophy in the last decade has been if we guide forward, maybe that will have the effect we want without actually taking the actions. Sure. So maybe they don't have to take rates to 10%. But this would be the first time, if they're able to get this inflation under control, this would be the first time that the Fed funds hasn't had to go above the level of inflation in order to quell it. And some of that might be from guiding. Sure. Well, he, and I'm not saying this is like something that, you know, is, is different than what he normally does, but he does tend to end his meetings quite abruptly. <laughs> but the one question that, le- the last question yesterday uh, was talking about the federal government and whether or not, uh, you know, we now have to raise the debt ceiling again. Um, but does his policy play into, or his financial, uh, you know, it policy play into what is happening over in Congress and whether or not that's going to impact the federal debt? And he kind of quickly gave a, an answer and left, which tells me I think there's more to that story because if you look at what the federal government is doing, we're borrowing money now more expensive than ever, mm-hmm. and we're. It seems like people are more inclined to talk about the debt at least right now, than ever before. Um, anything that you can see on that front, what do you think Congress is going to do? Do you think we're just going to be a standoff between a new Republican House and a Democratic president where we're just posturing for a little while? Do you think we're going to get uh, a higher debt limit mm-hmm. here soon without a lot of incident? Do you think we're going to have a government shutdown? Do you you know, kind of put that crystal ball on? Yeah, I'm pretty politically agnostic only because the historical data shows that the stock and bond market, which is primary where I live, don't care. That's a great, it's, a, it's so true. It, it, at the end of the day, they kind of always figure it out. Mm-hmm. We might have 10 days off, of, you know, back and forth Absolutely. or whatever, but it would just kind of get, get through it. This will be the 109th time I think they've raised the debt ceiling. So yeah, it's a more of a, a political game than anything. Um, and does Powell's policy play into that? Of course it does. But he doesn't want to take a stance. He wants to be politically agnostic as well. Um, but he's a capitalist. And, and, you know, to the point you made earlier about they seem very hard-nosed, they were very hard-nosed that inflation was transitory. And when the data came in that it wasn't, I mean, he said we're, we're not even considering 75 basis points, and they did three. The next, the next three meetings was three 75 basis so could they pivot again? I mean, if we get a, if we get a really bad, let's say they're expecting hundred thousand dollars, hundred thousand job growth number, and we get negative seventy thousand, they could quickly pivot. I mean, he comes out and says pretty openly, most questions about predicting the future. Well, we just don't know. He says that a lot. We yeah. don't know. So I think there's this, and it's just a human behavior. We love certainty. I mean, we, and we want it to be one thing. So markets, economy, what's the one thing? Okay, it's Jerome Powell. This one person and his one decisions, that's all we need to think about. And he's saying, look, there's a lot going on. Somebody starts throwing nukes. It's, it's a, a different, different world. Mm-hmm. I mean, what's going on in China? Um, if they go back into shutdown, which I don't think is likely, there's just so much going on that he can't control that he's hesitant to say, yeah, we're going to. Well, I'll put you on the, we'll, we'll see if this, we'll make you make a prediction here. We'll put you on the record and we'll okay. see how this ages. <laughs> uh, a lot of people have said that the, the, the Fed is going to come down to three, three and a half, two and a half, and say, this is our new target. Mm. We're not going to go to 2%. That's, that's old news. Yeah. We're now 3%, three and a half percent, whatever it is, that's the new inflation target. Where do you think is going to happen? Do you think he brings it all the way back down to two, or do you think that... We kind of move that. That's a good question. I would say, you know, from everything he said, and he said, and he's very careful, like you said, because he knows everything. Everyone's hanging on every word, Mm -hmm. every body language, every face. I believe that when he says our goals are 4% unemployment and 2% inflation, that he means it. So I would say that they're going to, and like I said at the beginning, that may be the wrong stance. The right policy move may be to say, Let's talk about two and a half. Let's talk about three. Um, but like I said, it's a lofty goal. I just think they may be too focused, super hyper focused on two percent that they that they pull things too far. They were behind it on the way up. 
they seem to be getting behind it on the way down. So we'll see. But I would say, if anything, that they'll keep those targets. Well, they keep talking about the labor market and how it's really strong. I think it was Mike Rowe that I was, I think I heard him make a, you know, the Dirty Jobs Mm -hmm. um, host. I think he made a comment how, you know, yeah, we have a really good labor statistic, which, you know, the government manipulates, but there's a lot of people who have actually dropped out of working, period. And I think think he said it was like 700,000 to a million people have just stopped working. And they're like of working age people. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting number to me, because if you were to add some, or take, if you were to add those numbers back in, you know, what does the unemployment rate actually look like? But at the same time, we still have so many jobs that people aren't taking. And it's it's this kind of paradox, like people don't want to work. I don't know, it's a... And don't have to work, that's... Yeah. They're flush with cash. I mean, bank account balances are still up. People have not burned through the COVID savings. Savings rates down, cratered in fact. Um, But the excess savings has still not spent through. How much longer do you think Americans have on that? We'll see. I'm not sure. I mean, so when you look at like labor force participation rate, unemployment, you're right. There there is nothing in the labor market that looks anything like a slowdown, that looks anything like a recession. It's completely inverse to a recession, in fact. It's still growing. Yeah. It's hard to imagine a severe recession even despite the Fed, with the labor market as strong as it is. And, you know, we do want a strong labor market. But from, you know, Jerome Powell's chair, in his mind, inflation affects 90% of the population. Top 10%, you know, eggs double in price. They probably aren't even checking. For the rest of the working class people, everybody else, it matters how much a, a gallon of gas costs. It matters how much the grocery bill is. Uh, it matters how much rents are. So that affects 90% of people. If unemployment has to go up by 1%, 1.5% in order to fix that problem, they'll do it. Um, I don't even think they would be upset to see 4.5%, 5% inflation to get back down to 2% inflation. So, yeah, it's, I do think they have the right idea. Unemployment. Uh, unemployment. Yeah, okay, unemployment. Yep. 4% unemployment. Unemployment yep. to get back down to 2% inflation. I agree inflation. with you. Yeah. Uh, so. And it's the, it's the right goal when you think about the math. I could see it being, uh, it could bring some stability to the to that market as well because there's, I think this you know this trend where you've seen some people kind of job hop just really trying to ramp up their salaries and then you know the other side of that is okay well if you've really been on uh, I guess if you haven't been like a, a a really good employee for that higher salary or you haven't been loyal to your employer. The other side of that might not look so pretty in the in the tech world. That might be the the case right now because really the only industry that I'm seeing doing lots of layoffs right now is is the tech industry. Tech. You're seeing Google and Microsoft and mm-hmm. uh, I think Facebook and I think really all of them have done pretty substantial cuts and yep. uh, doesn't seem to be bleeding too much into into other sectors except maybe banking. Yeah. I have heard quite a few banking. Not yet. Um, you know, like mortgage lenders are way down. Mm-hmm. Uh, mortgage originators. That's, Makes sense. Yeah. I could see real estate agents probably feeling the squeeze. I'm um, sure. Yeah. So there's probably little pockets here and there. But like you said, a lot of this stuff is six months uh, exactly. old that they're looking at. And we still have some, you know, uh, some new data to come out. And the other side that I, I, I think about is these things don't happen overnight. Like when you start the train forward on a project, like in our world, it's a real estate project. It might be a year to get it up and closed and, you know, get it moving forward. Like we might be looking at property, especially if we're building something, it might be two or three years before we even put a shovel on the ground, right. like, you know, five years before we even open it. But if you stop it halfway through, it's not like these things restart overnight. Right. So if, if the Fed keeps the pressure on, I, I could see the real estate market really just pausing. I've, I know a lot of firms that aren't doing a lot of acquisitions right now. They're just kind of waiting it out. Yep. A lot of banks are doing the same thing. Just waiting it Wait out. And see. Just exactly. I mean, they don't have to. I mean, they're just waiting for the deal to come. Uh, but I don't think we're going to see 2008 level fire sales in the real estate or in the stock market. I, I, I just don't see it. I couldn't agree more. I mean, wait and see is as much a risk as putting money to work. So I would agree. I think, um, you know, you look at 
people holding cash right now and they feel feels great feels smart even but what if that deal never comes and all of a sudden you're paying 20 percent higher what if the stock market crash doesn't come i mean the stock market's up 10 percent this month it happens quickly so i i agree i'm not a big believer in wait and see um so that's my opinion on it but what about disruptions that are coming so pivoting off of today let's look let's look forward you know macro 10 years you're seeing microsoft invest billions of dollars behind chat gpt um Mm. you're seeing uh really the the electrification of a lot of things i mean you're you're really seeing that kind of take take uh take root and what industries are likely going to be the most disrupted and and how do you hedge a portfolio against some of those uh, disruptions for instance if you were owning a newspaper if you owned a newspaper business 50 years ago you might be making great money but I, you still see people hanging on to that and it's like i don't know that that seems like it's gone sure. like I, you maybe want to get into <laughs> yeah it might, it might be time to move on when do you know it's time to move on and, and you know i've heard maybe we'll talk about the auto market in, in particular you have one company that seems so far ahead of the others as far as innovation and development are the others going to be able to catch up uh, or are they just too strapped with debt because they're currently not selling an electric car and making any money mm. uh, maybe use that as an example and then talk more broadly about the other you know other markets that might might not be thought about right now yeah i think what investors can do to, to hedge their let's say their portfolio against innovation just be diversified right so if you're a Microsoft employee, probably shouldn't have half your net worth in Microsoft stock, and you probably do, maybe without even knowing it. Or if you're a, a, a doctor, let's say, should probably shouldn't have most of your money in pharmaceutical stocks. Maybe you want some real estate, maybe you want some international companies. So I think diversification is the answer to most of those risk problems around disruption and innovation. But it is an interesting discussion about EVs. I was listening to a podcast just the other day that said yeah, EVs are not the future, that the inputs, the carbon inputs to get there are so um, damaging to the, the environment that the payoff for the EV, it's not worth it. So the minerals that we would need to go totally EV, it'd be like a 300% increase in copper production. It's too fast. So I think combustion engine is probably here to stay for another 25, 50 years. Uh, and EVs will be a part of that, clearly. Um, but the, the carbon conversation, does it actually help the environment, I think is still up for debate because it's expensive to produce lithium batteries, for example. It's taxing on the environment to produce lithium batteries. So we'll see. We'll okay. See. So forward-looking, maybe the disruption isn't overnight with the EV industry. Mm-hmm. But something that has caught my attention is certainly this AI that yeah. is coming in a much more rapid pace than I think a lot of people were anticipating. I mean, this thing is, uh, you know, this it's this, incredible. It passed the, the bar exam. It almost uh, did as good as a doctor with like a yeah. medical exam. Mm-hmm. What do you think is, it like, it, where do you think that, that takes us? I mean, what do you think that people are going to do? I mean, if, is there, is everybody just going to be out of work? I mean, like, it doesn't, you know, somebody's going to have to, you know, somebody's going to have to be behind the machine, but if that machine's doing the work of thousands of people, what yeah. what does that do? It's an interesting conversation. So in the AI front, I think the challenge there is, which they're bumping into now already, is how do you make the programming um, ethically and morally, religiously, politically agnostic, for lack of a better term? I mean... You know, you can ask it to write a story about how great, let's use a polarizing figure, how great Donald Trump is. And it will say, well, you know, Donald J. Trump is associated with hate speech. And so uh, ChatGTP cannot write this article. But if you ask him to do it about Joe Biden, it'll do it. Those things will quick with the Internet, quickly make their way out to where people say, at least half the country says, we're not going to use this. So as far as the AI intelligence writing goes and code, I mean, I think kids can use the cheat on their homework for now. It's not quite where it needs to be, to be completely AI, where it has its, its own operating system. 
because um, there's clearly people behind the scenes saying what it can and cannot do. Does it feel like the beginning of the internet? Like, if you were to go back, you know, 1990s, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos is going out mm-hmm. saying, hey, I'm doing an online, raising money for an online company. And half the people he was raising money from said, what's the internet? Right. <laughs> That's mind boggling. Yes. Me. And he still was able to get the money in the door, but you probably have a vast majority of the, the United States who's like, what's AI? Yes. What are you talking about? Artificial intelligence? I, who cares? That's not here today. Like, But this might catch up to a lot of a lot of people. Yes. And I think we may have talked about this before, but one place that I specifically would say I'm worried about or that I look at to say AI is going to be a huge disruptor, self-driving vehicles. Couldn't agree more. Number one job for a high school educated male is truck driver. You take all those jobs away, you're going to have riots. I mean, uprising. So that's an area where it's a, you know obviously applicable AI situation, which very likely will be better drivers than humans. Uh, self-driving cars don't text, eat, and change their shirt while they're driving. So I don't think it will take long for us to wise up that it's safer. Um, it's just the technology getting there, which maybe is five years, ten years. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah, at some point. So I think those are the ones I look at. ChatGPT is cool, but I think to your point, it's more like um, the start of the Internet when it was dial-up. Where we go from there, that's one I look at. Or applicable things that you just don't need anymore. You don't, even colleges, probably don't need as many colleges as we have if you can get that much information well thought out at a couple tight. Couldn't agree more. Uh, I, you know, the driving's one. I see it just in any type of the, you know, robotics in general. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're really turning your car into a robot in a way. Uh, but where did the robot stop? I mean, what can it can't it do for us? Um, you know, maybe it's cutting our lawn, or uh, maybe it's roofing our homes. Oh, like, yeah. you, 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 all of a sudden, you're bagging like, your groceries. Exactly. All of a sudden, we're doing, or or stocking the shelves. I mean, stocking the shelves. Yeah, it, it's a lot that could be disrupted, and and like you said before, maybe the top ten percent, maybe it does impact them. I mean, maybe maybe we don't need a lawyer anymore if it's passing the bar exam already, <laughs> uh, but. You know, maybe that top one percent doesn't feel it here, but you're really going to feel it if you're losing truck drivers and uh, you know universities are getting shut down. I, I just really mm. do wonder where this is. It's going to be a very interesting political environment. Let me ask you a question. So on that front, let's picture that scenario. You've lost fifteen percent of the workforce. Walmart truck drivers. Anything menial, repeatable that can be done by AI. What do you think about the topic of um, universal basic income? for those folks. I mean, we've shown that the government can print checks and send them to people. I mean, everything's still functioning, and that happened. So what about when they say, maybe we start doing this per month? I thought that's where you were going to go with this. Uh, You know, I obviously don't have a crystal ball of what would happen, but it does seem like the government doesn't shrink. So (laughs) once you start it, the cat's out of the bag. Mm -hmm. Uh, And politicians don't like taking away the goodies. Uh, so if you turn that spigot off, it's a quick way to get yourself out of office, especially if, the, if you're taking away money from somebody. That's a great way to electrify a base to vote against you. Right. So you got you to gotta be really careful with that because when you look at the unfunded liabilities that the United States government has already with Social Security, Medicare, and everything, and we won't even talk about moving the, the age of Social Security when, you know, when it was put in place. It was 65 years old is when that was the life expectancy. Sure. But now we can't touch that sort of stuff. So... I, I lean away from maybe the government being the solution. However, this is new. I mean, this is this is going to be different. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think I am. You know, I think I gave this example to you in the past, where you know, if you were to go back a hundred years ago and you asked somebody or you told somebody, "Hey, I'm a dog walker for a living," they would be like, "What?" Right. But now, because the world yes. is kind of there's there's new positions that we don't know about yep. that I think will will come forward. Um, maybe it's no longer truck driving. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you're not the guy on the tractor um, plowing the field. Yes, because uh, all of that's getting done. But maybe there's so much something we're not even talking about. Yeah, there's so much consumption. Mm-hmm. I mean, somebody walking your dog is a form of consumption. I mean, there's just so much new stuff that could be coming. 
I think that's where my optimistic side goes. I I like that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the answer how to how to feed and house all these people, but it it's a slippery slope. I mean, if you start just saying we print everything, remember inflation's transitory. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're living it. It's on yeah. the other side of it. It's like sometimes. Um, but the government tells you isn't 100 percent true, and, and to that point in the debt conversation, you know, this new tax bill that came out, they changed a few more things, um, 401ks, IRAs, etc., pushed the required minimum date back that you have to start taking money out of retirement accounts, all these things. One thing they didn't touch, in fact, they made it more favorable in some cases, is the Roth provision, or paying tax on money now to put it in an account that never gets taxed again. So that's a huge tax cost to the government. So why would they not change that? Because it's not the current politician's problem. It causes income to come now, and that helps the budget so they can pay for other things. But down the road, it, it you know it's pushing it out to the next politician. So I do worry about that, that the government and the people who run it are always looking at what's gonna get me reelected now, not how does this affect our country long term. Sure. So I do agree, what would be the initial solution from a politician about truck drivers? Probably printing money, but is it the best? I don't know, this capitalism thing, it works. I mean, innovation, like you said, ask anybody a job like that, dog walking. Um, so I agree, I think that that's a good way to look at it. The the new provisions, you know, I was going to take this, I was going to go in a different direction for a second, but I want to go back to the new provisions that you were just talking about. Is there any strategies we should know about that you've you've studied? You know, you just mentioned the Roth or anything. Is there anything that you're doing differently than a year ago, two years ago? Um, I mean, there's, there are minutia changes. So, like, one example would be the RMD age getting pushed back. 85% of people use their required minimum distribution. So whether the government tells you to take it out or not, you needed it. So it doesn't really affect that many people. Again, it's more of a political move to show that they're trying to help things. Um, another one is, you know, there are lower income limits that, you know, now in a, in a 401k, if you're over 50, they have what's called a catch-up contribution. If you make over a certain amount, it's 145000 you can no longer make that contribution pre-tax. You can only make it Roth. Why? They want to tax it. So it's a good benefit, but it's going to hurt people who are making high wages trying to save taxes. So it's all minutiae. I wouldn't say there's any game changer that applies to everybody. Um, and they really love to go after that 150, yes. 200, 300, 400, 500 thousand dollar earner. Man, they really pay some taxes. Except on. for the student loans. I couldn't believe how high the, the income, I think if you make as a joint couple less than uh, 150, you're eligible for loan forgiveness. In most places in the country. Is that still going through in your opinion? I don't know. We'll see. All I know is most places in the country, if you make $150,000, you can probably afford the minimum on your student loans. Um, I, that was my only qualm with it, is it probably should have been lower. And again, you're helping the people who are college educated. They're not the ones who are, are hurting right now in the country. Yeah, they have student loans. Ooh, that that's they controversial. Voluntarily took. <laughs> I don't know all those uh, those protests say otherwise that they really want their loans. Or the uh, people who didn't go to college because it was too expensive. Is it is it fair? Uh, uh, you do see people like driving around in a brand new, you know, sixty thousand dollar E V like a Tesla or something and then they're like, I you know, have student loans. I'm like, mm, this doesn't add up for me. It's like you're you kinda you're uh, you're going the wrong direction yeah, with your finances there, but capitalism is a you know it's an it's a it's the of an individual you can do it a lot of ways, yeah. um, so. But there are people who you know genuinely got screwed by the system, and I, I don't mind. No question. Um, I think if anything needs to happen, or if you're going to do something to help with the student loans, you have to fix the problem first. Otherwise, we're just going to have. You're going to just enable people to go take even more loans, so the problem's even bigger down the road. Absolutely, you got to make sure there's transparency. You're, you're giving loans to 18 year olds. It's, it's hundreds, of thousands of dollars to 18 year olds. Yeah, it's it's a little, you know, I don't know. And that's why the universities have, are always building new everything all the time. Is they have an unlimited budget. Whatever right. it costs, the government will pay. 
So why wouldn't you? It, it's uh, human nature, I guess. So. All right, so we'll end on the changing world order because I had brought this up to you. <laughs> yes. uh, so the, the, the book, The Changing World Order, and he came out uh, with a, that it was like a 40 minute video and it actually got tons of views. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, what do you think is, is the, the takeaway from that book? Should we be worried about China coming over mm -hmm. and being the next world order or being the, or the America losing our place as the, the reserve currency for the world? Is that something you're at all concerned about today? Um, you know, like, yeah. is there a war that has to be fought to make mm -hmm. that happen? Like, we, a lot of these are unknowns, but I mean, is that something you guys are even thinking about when you're building a portfolio? Um, it's not something we necessarily think about when building a portfolio. We don't have a lot of exposure to China or Russia or these sort of totalitarian states with manipulated currencies, for example. Uh, but on the subject, personally, no, I'm not worried about it at all. Um, and it's real, they're really complicated problems, but two things I think get overlooked because they're complicated. And, you know, we talked earlier, Americans want easy. It's one thing, right? So it's China is going to invade Taiwan. That's going to... Demographics and geography. So the demographics in China are horrible. They have more old people than they do young. So old being over 65, young being 25 to 50. The spenders. Um, that hurts an economy, and that comes from the one-child policy, right? 20 mm -hmm. years ago, it's now affecting them. We have a pretty good demographics. Our Gen Z is a little small, which would be people younger than 22. Mm -hmm. So that'll push down the road some. But the millennials are, are huge. Uh, Gen X is huge. So we have that benefit. We, geography-wise, we're the biggest exporter of food and, and energy. Mm -hmm. um, we could be self-sufficient for hundred or more years easily um, yeah. so we're a net exporter of those things China they need the world economy in order for their economy to run they are a net you know in, they import all the inputs to make all the stuff so they can't like if for example take the the um, the Russian sanctions and apply them to China they're out of food within 10 years so Russia has food production, energy production. That's why they can do this, is the world needs the inputs. India, China, Brazil, they're still gonna buy it from Russia. Um, and, and we need the stuff from China. So indirectly, we're still supporting it. You put those sanctions on China, they're gonna have 500 million debt of starvation in 10 years. So I don't worry about it too much. I think the US is positioned really, really well for the next 50 years, just from a geography standpoint. And we have good partners, Mexico and Canada. Um, Mexican labor is now officially cheaper than China. Uh, Canada has a ton of, of food inputs. So no, I don't worry about that too much. Ray Dalio has a huge investment portfolio in China, which I think complicates the equation a little bit. Um, I think he's just, obviously, he's a smart guy. I mean. So I don't want to say he's wrong, but I don't worry about it to the same degree, to the same degree at all. I, I thought it was a very uh, thought-provoking book, video, and at a minimum it got people thinking maybe really on that high-level macro stance. For sure. I hope we don't go you know, the, the war route because I think it's going to be way worse than a World War One or World War Two, just because the technology that could be involved, and that you know, I hope we don't ever have to go. But you know, if we do go that route, I, you know, I, it does seem like that is human nature to fight it out. If you look at history, uh, as long as there's men, there'll be war, right? It seems yeah. that way. But yeah, I, I think I think the takeaway from what you were saying is kind of just get in. Be prudent, be thinking about it, but but be in the game. It doesn't sound like you're like, you know, I'm pulling money out, I'm worried about tomorrow, China's coming over here, or inflation's out of control, or the market's never coming back. It just sounds like the same basic boring principles that people don't like to hear. It's, <laughs> yes. it's not get rich quick, it's mm -mm. get in, keep it moving. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Well, but it works. It does work. It does. I appreciate you coming today. Thanks for having me. Good conversation. If people want to get in touch with you, why don't you tell us about who your target 
uh, you know, client is, mm -hmm. and then uh, give us a, a way for them to reach out. Yeah, if people want to get in touch with me, it'd be uh, Luke.Smith at wellspire.com and target client. I want to help people. End of story. If you need help, shoot me an email. That's the target. Well, Luke, I appreciate it. You're a great guy. If you have any, um, you know, if, if anyone listening has any, um, you know, stock market, 401k, Roth, um, you know, financial advisor uh, needs, give Luke a call and we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Appreciate it.